So we've been going through this series called Love That Glorifies. And we've been talking about a love, a love that's deep, a love that's genuine, a love that's authentic. Not a love of this world, but a love that glorifies God. And it's a deep, rich, sweet love. And the love that glorifies, we've tried to define this word glorifies. And we've been talking about it a lot because Scripture talks about it a lot. Exodus, as as Moses is leading the people out of Egypt, Moses goes on top of the mountain. It says the the mountain was covered in a cloud of God's glory. And then that first Christmas night, as the shepherds are out in the field, angels come down and it says, as the angels were coming, announcing the birth of Jesus, a light shone around them. It was the glory of God. As the angel said, do not fear. And so God's glory is hard to define as we get these manifestations of God's glory. And it's not, it wouldn't be right to say uh, God is that fire, that cloud of smoke in the mountain. God was not the light around the angels. Rather, the light and the fire and the cloud all point to the nature of God. They, They point to get people's attention so they see God. And that's what we can do in our love for others. And our love for others, it points to God's nature. And it points to God's presence and His, His awesome power. That's, that's the p- opportunity that we have with our love for others, to point to God and how we are loving others. Maybe a way to say it, God's glory, is to, to make Him look good. Right? These, these angels were announcing God and they're making Him look good. And so as we love others, we can make Him look good in the way we glorify Him by loving others. And so we've been talking about this love in different ways. We had kind of looking at this funnel. We opened it up really big as we talked about loving nations, loving all people as God has a heart for all people. We got a little bit thinner last week as we talked about loving our neighbors and having the opportunity when we see people around us that have needs, we can love our neighbors. And this week, I thought it was appropriate to talk about loving our families as we get smaller and smaller in that funnel. Loving our families and how loving our families glorifies God. Now, just because we maybe don't have a family next to us, maybe we desperately want a family, we don't. We, we all came from a family, right? But now as you've grown, you've grown apart from your families. Maybe you're sitting by yourself because your family wouldn't come this morning. We're We're not discounting that at all this morning and saying, no, you can't glorify God if you don't have a family. That's just untrue. We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, we can glorify God in everything we do. It says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Every time we have opportunities in life, whatever they are, if it's to eat, if it's to sing praise songs in church, if it's to love our family, whatever we we do in this life, we can glorify God. We're supposed to glorify God in all of it. We highlight God. We point to God. We make God look good in all the things that we do. And so as I talk about family this morning, again, maybe you don't have one next to you, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about what it means to glorify God. Maybe if you don't have a family or one that's broken or hurt or one that's distant and it's going to be awkward calling them today and just... The, the hard things that come sometimes with having a family in a broken world and having a broken family. Because we recognize that we're all on the journey of grace. In fact, Romans chapter 3 says we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. And so we all fall short of making God look good all the time. We try, but we fall short of that. But that's why God's love for us is so great. That's why our love for others needs to be so great because despite all of that, God continues to love us and he continues to rain blessings down upon us. So we're going to look at a passage from Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter six. It's in the Old Testament and it is, it is a huge passage for the Jewish people. This is a passage they all would have had memorized. This is a passage that contains the Shema, this one verse. They would have repeated many, many times throughout the day in their prayers. Uh, This is a passage that cannot be overstated, the importance of this passage in the life of a Jewish person as they went to, to worship God and to pray and to go about the things that God wanted them to do. And so, We're going to open this just by reading the first three verses and we'll go, eventually we'll read nine verses of this and we'll we'll kind of break it down and look at some different things. 
But here's starting with Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1 through 3. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you, to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all the decrees and commands that I give you so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. So here's the first truth that I want to explore a little bit as we go through this passage. The family exists for the glory and purposes of God, not for the glory and purposes of man. We, we can get this twisted around a little bit, that God designed the family for our purposes and for our enjoyment. And it's a blessing for us, right? We talked about how love in our world tends to end with us. We feel good about the love we get. But love that glorifies isn't just about us. Family isn't just about us. And some of the reason we do that is just our natural inclination for things to be about us. We become selfish people. And so we read some of the promises in here, like do these things and you'll have a long, good life. And we go, oh yeah, I want a long, good life. I'm going to have this family that's about me, right? And, and, and them taking care of me and my old age and me. Uh, being fulfilled and living through my kids and having all these activities to do. And, and so we get caught up and we twist this scripture around where we say, okay, this is about me. These purposes and plans become about me. It says, so that you may enjoy long life, right? I want that. And so I'm going to go and I'm going to read this as it being about me. But that's not the first, the first command in this passage, It's not the first purpose. The greatest purpose is not about necessarily having a family, but about giving God glory. And so we focus on the promise, not the reason behind the promise. And we do this in Ephesians chapter 6 as well. This Ephesians chapter 6 reiterates one of the Ten Commandments, which is one chapter earlier than what we just read in Deuteronomy. And this promise is given uh, uh, again in verse uh, one through three. It says, God, uh, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Again, we tend to focus on that promise and go, look, I want long life on earth. I'm, I'm gonna follow through with this family thing. I want them Uh, to help me in life. This is what God designed, right? But if we back up, we really read the first reason behind this. Verse two, it said, so that your children, so that you, your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all the decrees and commands that I give you. And so the whole reason behind Following God's command is so that you and your children and your children's children will fear the Lord. Now, what is this definition of fear? This is not maybe what we first think about when we think of fear in the world around us, like fear of heights or fear of tight spaces. This is not the biblical definition of fear when you read the word fear the Lord, because that's repeated a lot through scripture, fear the Lord. Biblically, fearing the Lord is this deep reverence and awe for God. It's an understanding of of God's power. It's an understanding of God's presence. And we see some of this a little bit earlier in the the chapter before, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29. It says, Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep all my commands always so that it might go well with them and their children forever. Again, the, the purpose of this and so that they would fear the Lord. But it, it has this indication that their hearts would be inclined, that their hearts would be drawn to me, that their hearts would see who I really am. And this is defined by fearing the Lord. That's what this, this phrase, fear the Lord, means. And so the purpose of following God's commands and having part of the family is to glorify God. Again, you may not have a family, you look around, you go, I wish I could celebrate Mother's Day. We don't have children. This is maybe a hard day for you. Let me, 
Let me give you this understanding from this passage. Your greatest purpose in life is not to have a family. It is to glorify God. Your greatest purpose in life is not to have a family. It is to glorify God. And it goes back to that 1 Corinthians passage that we read. Whatever circumstance you find yourself in, you glorify God. If it's with a family, then you do it with your family. If it's not with a family, then you don't do it with a family. But you are to glorify God in all circumstances. In fact, having a family, we can become somewhat distracted. And again, twisting this passage around and, and going, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pursue the promises of God more than the glory of God. I want to give an illustration with this. It's an illustration I heard recently. Uh, several staff members, we got the opportunity to go to a conference and someone was preaching on the glory of God, preaching on the, the purpose of life. And they gave this illustration of a video game, right? Because in video games, if you played a, a mo- especially a modern video game, there's a main quest, there's a main purpose, there's a main maybe villain that you need to beat. But on your way to that, there's a lot of different side quests. There's a lot of different things you can do. I'm playing a video game with my son right now. Um, I, I play it by myself. I don't play with my son, if I'm honest. Um, that there's a, there's a main quest, but there's a lot of other things you can do. You like cook food to help your health and you can prove your weapons and all of that. You can help other people along the way. It's really easy to have fun doing those things and to forget, oh yeah, there's a main bad guy I need to beat in this game, right? Because you just get caught up in all this other stuff that's fun and entertaining and like little puzzles to do and little things you didn't even know existed. And you're like, oh wow, this is really neat. I'm going to do this. This is what we can what we do in our families sometimes, this temptation to get, si- to get sidetracked by all the, the side quests of life. And they could be great blessings and fun and happy in life. But if they distract from our main quest to bring glory to God, then there's something wrong. Right? We, the, the point of our family is not to create academic superstars. It's not to create Olympic athletes. Those things can be good to pursue. Those things can be helpful. But would they distract from the main, main part of bringing glory to God, there becomes a distraction. There becomes a disconnect between the love that you have for your family that isn't glorifying God because it's not helpful to the main purpose of why God designed you and why God designed your family. Let's continue on with this Deuteronomy passage get to maybe one of the most important verses here for the the Jewish people and even here in the Old Testament says, verse four, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. This is a difficult passage for interpreters to uh, translate from the Hebrew language to English, just all the breakdown of what this means, our God is one. My understanding is, is how this passage emphasizes the difference from Israel than all other nations. See, all other nations had a, had a God when they planted and they had to pray to that God to help the, the crops grow. They had a God to pray to for it to rain. They had a God to pray to for pleasure. They had a God to pray to for war, but not Israel. Israel's different. They had one God because he is God above all other gods. He is Yahweh. And he is the God of Israel and he is the God to come to for all things. And so this verse, though it may seem out of place, is emphasizing the oneness of God. But we we see that God is more than just one. He's one God, but if you've been around church, you may have heard the word Trinity. And we're going to talk about the Trinity a little bit this summer when we talk about the Holy Spirit and the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So I don't have to have time this morning to get into all of this, but I want to look at a passage in Genesis about how when God created, we see God creating in a, in a sense of plurality. Not that he's more than one, but he's three in the Godhead, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So when God is creating in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it said, then God said, let us make mankind in our image. You see the plural language. In our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, over all creatures that move along the ground. So God did that. He created mankind in his own image. In the image God created the male and female, he created them. 
God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And then you read this passage in Deuteronomy that we just said, but, but God is one. How is he our and one? That's the uniqueness of God as he lives in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And so how, what does this have to do with families? We're talking about family. Look, you are created in the image of of God who lives and loves an intimate community. You're created out of a plurality of a Godhead who lives and loves in community. And the greatest reflection of the community of the Trinity that we have here on earth is the family. The relationship among husband and wife is a unique relationship unlike any other relationship In this world, there's a physical connection that God designed to be between husband and wife that shouldn't be part of any other relationship. That's how God designed it. That's what God commanded for us. Now, our world tends to see it different, but God says, look, this this is a unique relationship. There's going to be a unique sense of intimacy between husband and wife that isn't present in any other relationship. Why? Because it reflects, in part, the relationship between the Trinity And how the Trinity is in that loving and living in the community. And so it is with children. You go, I didn't know I had a greater capacity for love. And then your baby was born and you go, I do have more love. Look at that baby. And you you don't realize like, babies just look weird, right? When they're first born, you're like, is the head supposed to be shaped that way? I hope that gets fixed, right? Who's going to do something about that? Their eyes are kind of like, what? But you love that child like you never knew you had the capacity to love. Because we, we, we reflect the, the life and the way that the Trinity lives in community. Now, again, our world is broken. We don't all live in families. How is this reflected? How can I experience this if I don't have a family around me? I want to encourage you with this. The church family is a demonstration and expression of that love. The church family as a demonstration and expression of that love. I said the closest resemblance of that intimacy that the Trinity has is your, your immediate family. But the other representative we have of that in this world is the church family. If we go to Ephesians chapter five, we won't read any of it, uh, any of it but it's, it's this great passage of scripture. Some of, sometimes it's misused and abused because it says things like wives submit to your husbands and people just read that verse and go, you know, this, and they, they abuse what's really being said in that passage. And, and actually the great beauty that we can see, that, that's true. But what we see in that passage, the reason, the reason for that, if you follow the, the reasoning of the entire book of Ephesians, we see the Trinity, the Godhead that we just talked about. We see that structure in the church, how there's submission. The church is, as people, we submit to Christ because Christ loved us so much to give his life for the church and the people of the church. And so we submit to Christ as being the head of the church. And then that is a picture of the family. And so we follow this and we go, oh, now I understand. Right? It's not saying be, be submissive of, of something. Husband, it's actually saying husbands, love your wives like the Jesus loved the church. How did Jesus love the church? He gave his life for the church. And so we start to understand the beautiful picture that's all entwining the Trinity and the church and the family. And we go, I see how this is being lived out. I see how this is being reflected here on earth and understanding these words of Jesus. Look at John chapter 12. I read this passage the first sermon on this love that glorifies. And Jesus is picturing the cross in front of him. And he says, starting in verse 27, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And so Jesus is submitting to the Father. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it was it, and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said this voice was for your benefit, not mine. 
And so in this passage, we see Jesus submitting to his father to glorify the father. And so in our families, we submit to one another and our families to glorify our father in heaven. And there's other passages. Jesus talks about how all authority has been given to him on, in heaven and on earth. Well, if all authority has been given to him, how does he also submit to the father? Well, he has the authority, but he uses that authority to submit. It's this, this beautiful relationship of the Trinity. Again, we can't talk about it all this morning, but it's just this beautiful intertwining of, of, of submission and leadership in the Trinity that's reflected in our churches and in our families. As we continue to go on in this passage, we're going to read again some more important words um, about our families. Five, let's finish this passage, verse 5 through 9. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. When you lie down and when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Here's my last point for this morning. Our love for God is demonstrated in our love for our families and others for God's glory. There's, there's a relationship between our love for our family and our love for others and our love for God. They're connected. The way we demonstrate our love for others. In this passage, specifically talking about family, that you are the greatest influence on your children. You are the greatest disciplers of your children. And for you to love your children enough that when you're, when you're walking down the road, you're telling them about who God is. When they're going to bed, you're talking about the great things Jesus did for you that day. You're, you're impressing them on your children. You're wearing them on your hearts, putting them on your forehead. The Jewish people took this literal and had little boxes on their forehead with these commands on them because they, it, was, it was so important to them. And we don't see this as a, a literal thing to be done, but we understand the importance of what this passage is getting at. Now, the purpose of your life is to glorify God. How do you do that? You love your family well. How do you love your family well? You, you impress these commandments on them, the importance of who God is. Allison Murray, our, our director of children's ministries, loves this verse, uses this over and over again because she doesn't want to be someone, she knows she can't be sub, someone that substitutes as, as their parent and you can just drop your kids off. No, 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 you need to, to love them enough to instruct them, to disciple them. All those things are great. Come to our children's programs, doing the different things. But you as a parent, love your family well. And I also include the language in their love of others. Maybe not everybody in this room has children. You want to be a mother this day and it's a hard day for you to celebrate. You love others well with that genuine, pure love. Here's just a few verses from the New Testament talking about this love for our family. This first John passage uses the word brothers and sisters, and John does that through this gospel to talk about uh, church, the, the people in the church, but he does it in a familial way that represents the relationships that we have in our family as well. First John chapter four, he says, whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar, right? Why? Because your love for God is connected to your love for others. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. First Timothy 5, 8, anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. First Corinthians 7, 17, 17. nevertheless, this is, a, this is a great passage. Paul's talking to singles and widows and all this great passage. You go through that entire chapter. It says, nevertheless, wherever you find yourself in life, married or unmarried, committed to someone or not, nevertheless, each person shall live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned them. Whatever it is, you give glory to God. Just as God has called them, this is the rule I laid down in all churches. We're gonna end our service a little bit different than we normally do. Aaron Persall is gonna come up in just a few moments. Uh, as they had a ladies' retreat this past weekend, and they're going to speak to f a few things on that retreat and uh, kind of give a, a blessing to the mothers and ladies in the room this morning. But before we do, I just want to remind you to love others with a love that glorifies. 
It's a love that doesn't end on that person because it glorifies God and it's a deep love. It's a rich love. It's a sweet love. It's a beautiful love. Let me pray before she comes up. Dear God, I thank you so much for the love that you gave us as a church family. And as we live out that love as a church family the best, the best we can with whatever you've given us to glorify you, that you'd also give us that in, in our families, the families where we found ourselves, the families that you've blessed us with, God. We want to honor and glorify you. We want to we make you look good in that family and in the relationships we have. God, let us stick to the, to the main thing in those families, God, as we glorify you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.